Welcome back to our study of the Minor Prophets. And tonight, we will be wrapping up the book of Zechariah. Uh, we'll be going through 12, 13, and 14. Uh, so these will be some of the most amazing prophecies that we will read about tonight uh, in the Bible that we either read or we hear. And, and we'll be talking about a little bit about the coming of the Lord and His initial coming. And then largely, we'll be reading a lot about the nation of Israel as a whole in the tribulation period, the millennial period, and the battle Armageddon at the end. Uh, we believe as though, for me, I believe in, or we believe that after we study the Word of God, like Daniel, Revelation, Ezekiel, and Zechariah, and some of the other uh, the books, that we believe that there's a time coming on the earth where the Bible calls it the Great Tribulation, when at this time there will be great difficulty unleashed on the earth. And I'm not going to get too much into the, to that end time theme uh, when the uh, Antichrist takes over and the peace agreement signed and, and all that. But, you know, I feel that sometimes that there will be, there's so, much, there'll be so much evil and so much bad, uh, it'll run rampant on the earth. And uh, as a church, we'll be caught up in the way. We'll be caught up before the tribulation period happens. This is what I believe. Uh, the church will be snatched away or caught away. The word is rapture, but that's, that's the, uh, the English translation of the word um, from the Latin. But for us, we look at it that God will call his church out before the Great Tribulation. And this is, you know, this is a belief that is not in the whole body of Christ. There's many different beliefs where some believe, you know, you're pre-trib, mid-trib, end time. Um, so there's a lot of different beliefs here. There are some who, uh, different timing when the events happen, and, and that's okay. Um, we need to be prepared. We need to... Uh, be prepared that God can come back at any time. And, you know, and like I mentioned before, some believe that in the beginning, like us, pre, uh, pre-trib, pre and there's some middle and there's some end. And then there's one that, that I have seen where it's after the mid, but before the end. But I don't know too much about that one. But um, that Jesus will come one day and call his bride with him. And... You know, based on the scriptures, I believe that the church will not go through the tribulation period. They will be caught up before that period in that time uh, for God. And at that time, I think the, tr the tribulation period is a time where God and the, and the Jews will get reacquainted. And it's a time, I think, for a sense of, of God's people, a time of repentance for Israel to come back to God. Because I think most of the, most where I read some of the articles I read, that some, of the, some believe that most of the Jews nowadays or atheists. There are some believing Jews. You can see that, or we'll just say uh, believing Jews, and then there are some that, you know, we see them at the, uh, the Wailing Wall where their heads are bobbing and they put prayer requests in the wall. But there are some practicing Jews. I'm not saying they're all atheists, but the majority are. And what we'll see in Zechariah is how God will do this, and we'll get some prophetic insight um, from him, like the like repentance. We need to be repenting on a daily basis. Uh, and, and how this will look like back then you know i still get in my mind and i i get excited to see how it's all going to play out because we don't know everything you know and after the church is pulled away from the earth the earth will be thrust in what we call the great tribulation in the last seven years and at first it'll seem like everything is going well on the earth kind of like the flood with noah and all of a sudden boom uh and israel will enter into a peace contract with the antichrist and they will that they will think that he is the man of the hour, but he will turn around at about midpoint, they say, in the tribulation, and then he will exalt himself in the temple. Uh, he'll outlaw worship of Yahweh, and he'll pursue, uh, persecute the Jews and any believers that come to Christ during his period. Yes, there will be people saved during the tribulation period. There are going to be people. It, it's, it is. And as God continually extending his grace and mercy to, 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 to his creations. Uh, God's wrath will be poured on the earth, and the nations of the world will gather against Israel to attack Jerusalem at, a, at, at some particular time, particularly Jerusalem. Uh, many people will die in this horrible time on the earth, especially uh, in Israel. They will look like they're about to go under. You know, how about you? Have you ever gotten to a place where you feel that your your life's about you're about to go under? Maybe it's bills or. Uh, you're having issues, you're having problems. And right before they do, the Lord will descend from heaven, empowering Israel and destroying the enemies. 
And it's kind of like us, you know, we, sometimes we feel like we're going under and all of a sudden, where are you, God? Where are you, God? Where are you, God? And all of a sudden, boom, God shows up and says, bam, here I am. He says, I've been with you all this time. I've been waiting on you to call out to me. And at this time, Israel will recognize Jesus as their Savior. We don't know how and when they will recognize him. We just, we just don't know, meaning, will they, will they recognize him before the battle? Uh, will they recognize him descending? Uh, we, we don't know exact timing here. But we know that'll happen. But there will be a day of, of national day of repentance for Israel. God will set up his kingdom in the millennial period, and they will receive him and embrace him. At last, the last three chapters of this book are largely about this. And we will have to understand that, listen, this is not a novel. So some of these prophecies go back and forth. Uh, we'll bounce around a little bit in chronological order. Uh, there are things in the Old Testament that have not happened of yet, of even today, that will happen later in our lives. So we know that there's things that we'll see in Zechariah. He'll bounce around a little bit in the last three chapters, but he will speak of strong emphasis of the coming of the Lord, noted as referring to the day of the Lord. Uh, and on that day, uh, we will have, depending on your translation, should, will be about, uh, I think it's mentioned 16 times, could be a little bit more, uh, just in these three chapters alone, the day of the Lord when when Christ uh, comes uh, for Israel. Uh, but interesting, listen, when he comes for Israel, see, that don't look for the church in here. There are people that believe in, that the church is mentioned in the Old Testament, uh, and there's people that believe, no, it's not. I, I have not seen where the church um, has been mentioned in the Old Testament. I see it, the Israel's not really the church. It's the nation of Israel. Uh, but we can get at that in another class, another time. But don't look for the church here. Uh, but gather the, we, we need to look at the Old Testament as gathering information, gaining wisdom. But the church is not here. Paul referred to the church as a mystery. As I mentioned last week a little bit, uh, the church was, um, it, it's, it's, it's something that's different. Um, but let's go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse uh, 1. He says, the oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. He's saying who? Israel. It doesn't say the oracle of the word of the Lord concerning the church. Okay? So it says, thus this clears the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Who is God speaking to? He doesn't say the church, like I mentioned earlier. Understand, the church does not take over for Israel because Israel rejected God. He, the church does not. We, we don't have replacement theology here where the church took over the blessings of Israel because Israel rejected God. Now, there's, there's a, there's, there's a let's, let's put it this way. There's a part of God's plan for the church, and there's a part of God's plan uh, for his, the nation of Israel. Um, two different, it's almost like two different stories in one, one book. I um, hope I make it understandable, but God is this, even... You know, there's a separation. There's something that's going to happen for the nation, and there's something that's going to happen for those of the church. Okay, God is establishing his power, his rule, his authority right here, and he also declares these things and the ability to carry them out. There's one thing when you can say you can do something, and it doesn't happen, but when God speaks, we know when God speaks, it happens. It's almost like it's God's business card to the world of who he is. Here, here's my resume. He says, The oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. The next thing you can see in verse 2. Behold, I'm, I'm, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will, will also be against Jerusalem. Now, yours may say reeling. My, uh, the ESV says staggering. And it's interesting that it's an interesting word. It's a response from someone who is drunk. You think about, oh, look at that guy. Look at that bum over there. He's staggering. Or that drunk guy or drunk woman staggering over there. And, and God is saying this. I'm going to make it in such a way it'll throw people for a loop. Into, into it's kind of like a, I don't want to say craziness because we know that God doesn't bring uh, chaos or disorder. But it'll almost like, it'll be something totally, it'll, it'll say, whoa, wow, what's going on here? So, but, how often do we hear about Jerusalem in the news? The Pope is talking about it, the Arabs are talking about it, and the Jewish people are talking about it. Even our government is trying to, to bring order in that area. Remember, for thousands of years, there's never been a real peace in the Middle East. But we know that won't happen until G Jesus comes. And, 
And Jerusalem is still the center, the center of a uh, piece of the world. It's the important to the Jews, and it's also important to the Arabs or Arabs. And we know that it's important to the Jew because it's mentioned over and over again in the Scripture. Jerusalem's not mentioned in the Quran at all. Now Mecca, they would consider a holy to, to the Islam. And Mecca would be something that's a holy site in, in, in the Islamic faith, but not Jerusalem. But it's been recent, though, if you watch the news and hear some stories now, the Arabs want uh, Jerusalem, even though that the Dome of the Rock is built where the temple was to be built or was built. Um, the Arabs do not want the temple built. We know why. Because Christ, it's going to happen anyways, because it's God's word. But look at all the interest in Jerusalem. And what God is saying is, Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup staggering to all the surrounding people. We know that Jerusalem is the center of the prophetic history in the future. It's something to look forward to. This is actually, it's exciting because, you know, we may get to see a lot more things happening um, on our planet. And it's, it's almost like, you know, I don't want to be bad, but it's almost like going to Disney. You get Kids get excited to go to Disney. I'm excited to see what how things are going to unfold and what God's going to do. It's an exciting time for us. You know, and, it, and he may tarry another another 100 years or 200 years, and we may we are maybe in, up in heaven by the time um, this all happens. But it's going to happen. And on verse 3, it says, On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people, and all who fit or lift it will surely hurt themselves, and the nations of the earth will gather against it. Now, this means it doesn't mean that Israel will not be affected during the Great Tribulation period, but because said that they, they would be like an immovable rock or heavy stone, they will be affected by the oncoming armies. And it says, And all the nations of the earth will gather against it. The Antichrist will bring them together. And there will be a lot of bloodshed, carnage, and great loss of life during this time. But know that when I mentioned earlier that it may seem like to them it's all is always gone, all hope is gone. But God's going to inter inter intervene in their in their behalf. God is still going to. God still loves His people. He loves them, and this as much as He loves us. And God's going to save and spare them. Verse four and five say this: On that day, on that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider in madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. Now, this would suggest prior to coming to the Lord on behalf of Israel to recognize, they are recognizing that God is the one giving them some strength or some level of strength to stand in their difficulties. And they can say, we are standing because of God. It is a big deal because, like as I mentioned, a small portion of Jews who, who are still practicing Jews, most are atheists. And we see them in the news wailing and bobbing their heads, putting their prayer requests in the, in the cracks of the wall. They are a very small minority. But their recognition of God will come either prior or the coming of the Lord. We, like I said, there's a timing that we... We just don't know. There's some things in the scriptures that we don't know, like the definite, that there's de no definites. And on that day, verse 6, and on that day I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of the wood, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. And I and they shall devour to the right and to the left the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. And the Lord will give salvation to the tents of the first of the Judah first that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. And on that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that they, the feeble, feeblest among them on that day shall be like David and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. God will supernaturally strengthen his people, enable them to stand against the enemy at this time. Because verse 9 goes on and says, On that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That is something that has not happened yet. This is something that's going to happen. That God's people will stand next to Jesus fighting the enemy. That's pretty cool. Let me think that's, I mean, that's, how do you think it would be? You know, Jesus standing right next to you in the, in the, physical, in the physical part and fighting the enemies. And I think, it's, I think this is an exciting time. 
But this has not happened yet. And this, this is something that Zechariah is giving a prophetic word. This will happen, though. Now, make sure you go back and go through the scripture again so you get, you get a better understanding. Not what I'm just saying, but what other people are saying. Go in and, tell, and ask the Holy Spirit to continue to reveal more and more to you. In verse 10, it says, And him who they have pierced. Let's, let's look at verse 10. And it says, And I will pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace, and, and, and please for mercy, so that when they look upon me, on who? On him. On him who have perished, they have mourned for him, as one who mourns only for a chi only child, and weep bitterly over him, as one who weeps over a firstborn. Now listen, God is going to pour out his mercy of his spirit on the house of Israel, so that when they look on him, God was the one that they had, they had pierced. There, this is what... This is what they're, what is going to come to their mind. God is the one that they had pierced, the crown of thorns through his hands and his feet. Remember, they, they, they went through, his, they put him on the cross and the crowns they had pierced. Whether this is a revelation that they're going to receive before his coming or that the Holy Spirit moves on their heart, it's not clear. Uh, they will recognize Jesus and they will mourn with a national repentance that will, that will occur. Just like when Jonah went to Nineveh and Jonah fought God against it, there was a, na a national day of, re of repentance and mourning for their sins. And this is the same thing that will happen to, to the nation of Israel, that they will realize that Jesus was the Messiah and that they're the ones, well, really, it's our sin that put them on the cross, but they rejected him as their Messiah. And they will realize that. And now they, and there will be a time of repentance. And how many know Repentance is good. Can you imagine if the United States would repent for what they have done? How they, uh, all the atrocities they have allowed to happen are in, our, in our government and people's lives. Can you imagine if we would all just fall to our knees and just cry out to God? You know, repentance is, is important. We must look at Jesus when we, when we repent. It's what he has done for us. Um, but they're going to see, they're going to, to me, they're going to look back and see all of what Christ had did for them and what God did for them. And, and I think it's going to take a time to draw repentance. Like when we give our hearts to Christ, we look back at our past and how much God had forgiven us. You know, how much mercy, how much grace was given to us. And we need to mourn that. We need to say, you know what, I, I was, but now I'm forgiven. And we're forgiven not past, present, and future. And that we, as we live our lives, we don't sin like we used to sin. That our lives are growing closer to God. Yes, we still do sin. But we need to have been in a place where we're walking like Jesus. Like uh, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Be imitators. We need, to, we need to be like Christ. People need to see Jesus in us. You know, we think about, you know, at the end times when they talk about the mark of the beast. And everybody's worried about the mark of the beast. Is it, the, is it a vaccination? Is it... Is it a, a microchip in our hand or our wrist? Or is it a tattoo of uh, three numbers on our foreheads or something? When we gave our heart to Christ, our heart, our lives were marked for Jesus. That means our lifestyle, our hearts. See, listen, a microchip cannot tell you to, 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 give your, to, to renounce Jesus. It can't stop you from glorifying God. You know, the only way that, that this affects us is that we choose to walk away from God. That's when you receive the mark. It's a choice of your heart. It's a choice of, from you speaking it. Romans 11, uh, verse 25 through 27 says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of the mystery. Brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's it. And in a way... In this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them, and I will take away their sins. Now, Paul's speaking at a time here in Zechariah, where the nation of Israel would collectively recognize the Savior, Jesus, as a whole. Because verse 11 says, On that day, the morning of Jerusalem will be as great as the morning from Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. And... If you remember, when you read verse 11, if you, if you remember the history of King Josiah, remember, he was a young king, and as he got older, uh, he was the one king that was king, killed in battle, and it was an unnecessary death. Uh, Pharaoh Necho was riding out to battle with someone else, and Josiah mounted 
to oppose the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh said, listen, O king of Judah, you know, don't oppose me in my battle. It's not against you, Josiah, but I am obeying the, I am obeying the Lord. In this, stay out of my way. And King Josiah did not listen and, and heed the word, and he died. And there's a great mourning in the nation, of, and, and Zechariah mentions it there, because, um, you know, we need to mourn. We need, need to mourn, but not to stay there. Verse 12 through 14 says, The land shall mourn for each family by itself, the family the house of David by itself, the wives by themselves, and the family the house of Nathan by, himself, by itself. And their wives by themselves, and the family, the house of Levi by itself, and the wives by themselves, and the family of Shemites by itself, and the wives by themselves, and the families that are left each by itself, and the wives by themselves. That's a tongue twister there. But there's a great wave of mourning there. And I wonder though, for myself, how much time will it take for them to put it together from their past to their present? You know, and I'm sure the nation of Israel will be looking at the prophecies that Jesus gave and everything that's in the book and, and put, I think eventually they're going to put two and two together and see that Jesus was, as we know, that Jesus is, was their Messiah, their King, and that they rejected him. Chapter 13. And on that day there shall be a fountain opened in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sins and uncleanliness. Now, when Jesus comes back to establish his throne and fights for his people, Israel and Israel, there will be a fountain that flows from the city. Now, this has been fulfilled in you and I and with a person of the Holy Spirit as salvation. When you gave your heart to Christ, the Holy Spirit sealed you and you were filled with the presence of God. Uh, the fountain that flows, uh, you know, sometimes we take for granted. We have, like, uh, uh, for ourselves, we have water spigots or faucets that we can go um, to use for, for flowing water in our lives even today. Back then the Jews had to dig down in the well. I mean they had rivers, but there were it was a chore for them to get water. Like we can get water anywhere. We get it in bottles, we get in and we and it's 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 sad, but we're kind of like really blessed how you know this country it, it is. We get we if we, like here's a bottle of water here. I mean it's 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 just simple. But the interesting thing is the fountain flows and it's something that the picture here is that it, it keeps flowing. It's just an ongoing flow. But then he says it cleanses them from their sin and of uncleanliness. Now listen, I don't believe they're going to be saved differently from us. Like we know it's the blood of Jesus. We know it was his life, his 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 death, his resurrection. We know that's how salvation comes. It's, it's by the blood of Jesus. His perfect sinless sacrifice. We know that. But I think it's a picture that what the scripture is trying to show that that we get to enjoy now that the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit flowing within us every day. And that's something the, the nation of Israel has not had. They have not experienced that. The only time that the Holy Spirit fell in them was when the Holy Spirit came upon them for a certain reason or for a certain time. And, you know, and it, the fountain just flows. You know, I always like taking a trip up the Niagara Falls because it just seems like it never ends. It just keeps on going over and over and over. And, you know, and that's like we, 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 the Holy Spirit is continually flowing in us. Uh, 1 John 1 says, uh, verse 6 and 7 say, If we say we have fellowship with him while we are in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, he's in the light and we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And I looked up the word cleanse in, in, in the Greek. It just means a perpetual work. You know, we're continually as we continually just walk in that journey of our lives, the blood of Jesus just covers us and, and, and purifies us. And that's why we have sanctification. It's a lifelong process. It's, it's, you know, there, are some, there are some teachings out there that believe once you gave your heart to Christ, you were sanctified right there and then. And that's not my, my, what, what my heart is, my belief is. Mine is that when you gave your heart to Jesus, yes, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. But it's a lifelong process to continually just get the old out and, and, and to continue to allow this um, uh, continual refreshing from his presence and his spirit. So the fountain here in verse 1 you can see is a perpetual cleansing continually of God's presence, washing his spirit, washing over you and I on a daily basis. And that's something we need to do is allow his spirit to just continually wash over us. Even 
when we have the good days and when we have some really horrific days, we need to allow His presence and His Spirit just to wash over us continually. Verse 2 says, And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the, the idols from the land so that they will remember no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets in the spirit of uncleanliness. And it's interesting, he said both of them, he separates it a little bit. The two biggest sins in Israel were idolatry and false prophecies. And God is saying, listen, I will establish my throne and there will be no more idols. And not just prophets, but the spirit of impurity, which moved in those prophets. Now listen, the spirits in Israel that would move on the prophets, they would, they would, be ridic they would say ridiculously stupid thinking, people to draw people away that's what false prophets do false even today you have people all over social media prophesying this is the end of the world god's punishing the earth and and there's this it's it's the end of the world you know buy my book buy some this holy water and it's just nuts you know and, and we get barraged by this stuff you know i guarantee there's going to be people coming out with books it's the end times coronavirus is going to is the start of the beginning and you know i'm like trying to you know, rip on or tear them. No, it's just for people who don't study the word or people who are young in the Lord, they start, they, they eat this stuff up because they don't know. And if you're watching this, and, and thank you for watching this, um, we study the word. We, we, we devote ourselves to the word of God. And we, we want to watch, we want to be good stewards. We want to be, we want to see what's truth and what's lie. We want to, we want to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, what's going on today. And, and then it says there will be great devotion to Christ. And there will be devotion to understanding who he is. Listen, people will rid the land of those people. It's interesting because he goes on and says this. Um, For you speak lies in the name of the Lord. His father and his mother who bore him shall pierce through him through the, when he prophesies. People will rid the land of those people who will speak ill of God. Can you imagine that today? If someone spoke ill of God, you know, a lot of times people say, well, thus saith the Lord. It's like, you know, God told me this or God told me that. And it's, hard to, it's, it's challenging if you, if you know, if, if you're in a relationship with people, because if you know they're not speaking right, you can say, hey, you know what? I don't really think that's God. You say, well, that, I don't hear from God. And, and on this day, they're saying, if people are going to speak lies about, against God, they're going to get rid of them, plain and simple. Verse four says, on that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies, he will not put on the hairy cloak in order to deceive. Now, uh, this is not talking about biblical prophets like the ones we're studying now of that day. God is dealing with the cleansing of the land of the false prophets. Remember how John the Baptist wore, how he dressed up really nice and a hairy cloak to deceive. Maybe the prophets, what the prophets wore. And he says, but they will say, I am no prophet. I'm a worker of the soil for a man of soul me in, in my youth and those who used to be false prophets or saying false prophecy will be ashamed of what they had done so when they were confronted they'll lie about it you know it's 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 going to be a, a great time to to be on god's side when this all happens and if anyone asks him what are the wounds on your back he will say the wounds i received from the house of my friends now this is how pagans uh this is going to open up probably a can of worms for some of you, but hear, hear me out and study the scriptures for yourself. Uh, he says, and if anyone asks him, what are the wounds on your back? And he will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. How pagan prophets would cut themselves and get the attentions of their gods. Some have heard, you know, some, some use this scripture as, as the Messiah, Jesus, but this is not the verse about Jesus. So when they tell you this is about Jesus, it's not about Jesus. In the context, it's speaking about false prophecy. Of When you see the story, you read the story, it's talking about false prophecy. False prophets, not Jesus. Uh, the, the context of the scripture is speaking about the false prophets, not the Messiah. But let's go back and it says, um, what are those wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received from my house of my friends. Uh, let's, go to Mar uh, let's go to 1 Kings 18 with Mount Carmel. Remember that Elijah faces off with the prophets of Baal. They, they remember they built the altar. They wanted to see whose God comes first, who, who, you know, and they, and they even start throwing sarcasm. And we can sing, see in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20. We're going to go from 26 to 20. Now I'm going to read a little bit more. And it says, uh, When they took the bowl, was given to them. They prepared it and they called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon. They said, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. 
No answer. And they, they limped around the altar they had made. And at noontime, which is funny, Elijah's pretty cool, he mocked them saying, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he's musing, uh, is he relieving himself? Like, hey, he's in the bathroom or is he uh, on a journey? Or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. They cried out and they cut themselves. Listen, they cut themselves after the customs and the swords and the lances until blood gushed out upon them. Okay? And in midday past they, they raved until the time of the offering was oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. You know, so let's take it now. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. Now remember, verse 20, 28 said, They cried aloud, they cut themselves after a custom source. These are what the false prophets were doing to get to the attention of their God. When you go back to Zechariah chapter 6, or chapter 13, verse 6, what's it say? These are the wounds on your back, he will say, that the wounds I received from my house. This is all going back to false prophets. Leviticus 19, verse 26 through 28 says, You shall not eat flesh of your blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or for tell fortunes. You shall not run off your hair or your temples or mar the edges of your beard. Now remember, Leviticus was, God was giving his people instruction on how to be seen, not to mark yourself of the world, not to mark yourself so people will look at you and say, oh, he's a Jew, he's an Assyrian, or he's from Babylon, whatever. Maybe God was calling his people out to look different, to be different. And you shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Now, tattoo there, the word is to be in the Hebrew was mark. Okay, now the priest and the people did these things for pagan reasons, for pagan gods. They marked their bodies for pagan religious reasons. Kind of like the end time mark I mentioned a little bit earlier. Don't worship like pagans worship. And when, when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal, what did they do? They cut themselves. Why? To get the attention of, the, of, the, of their false gods, their idols. Right? And God was saying, listen... You don't have to cut yourself. I'm here. You don't have to go around and circle and chanting things and slicing yourself up. You know, when you think of like when I met earlier, the mark of the beast. It's a heart thing. It's a searing. No one can stop you ever from worshiping God. No one can, even if someone would cut your tongue out, you can still profess Christ, praise him and worship him in your life. When you, when you think about the mark of the beast, think about there's something that will signify that you chose to follow the, the teachings of something else other than God. Like this. Um, I, like, I like the pirate games. I like going to pirate games. I have pirate shirts at home. I'm an official pirate shirt, an old one, and I have a pirate hat. So when I go to the games and I sit in the stands, when people see me, they will say, hey, that guy is with the pirates. He likes the pirates. Right? That's the same, the mark that... People will see when Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Our lifestyles, the way we walk, the way we, there will be something that will signify that I stand for Christ. And the mark of the beast will tell you this. Those who choose that, because it's a choice, it's a heart thing, they will look like they, they chose, they'll know whatever it may be. It, and we all don't know the answer to that one yet. Um, but they will, their lives will signify, I chose to walk with Satan. It's just, it's just simple. Don't get caught up in all these different fear things that you'll see in social media and the news. Because no one can force you. Now, if they say, okay, you have to deny Christ to get this microchip so you can you know, buy and sell, that's a different story. Because you chose to take the chip. If you choose not, that's, God will take care of you no matter, no matter which way you look at it. But it's, it comes down to a choice of life and who you represent. That's what God was saying to, in Leviticus. Who do you represent? So people see the difference between you and the people of the world. Verse 5 says this, but, I, but he will say, I am no prophet and I am no worker of soil for I'm a man sold in my youth. These are false prophets who are lying about it. They, you know, I got these at my friend's house. You know, maybe we were boxing or maybe we were fighting or maybe we were working. You know, I got these marks on my hands and my arms. They'll, they'll lie just to protect who they are. But now, when we get to verse 7, we are talking about Jesus. Because now it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. 
Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And I will turn my hand against the little ones. God is calling a sword on his son. It's his truth. His redemptive plan from the beginning. There, he knew that there had to be a sacrifice. Christ willingly stepped off the throne just to bring redemption to mankind. That, again, is a choice. It's a mark on your life. Now, even this, Jesus applied that to his life. He said in Matthew 26, verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, You will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He's just repeating what Zechariah just said. Verse 8 and 9 says this, And the, land, the whole land declares the Lord, Two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold tested. And, I, and they will call upon my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, These are my people, and they will say, The Lord is my God. Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22 says this, for there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And in those days have not been cut short, no human would be saved. But the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. There will be a great tribulation. And this will be a time that God's people, that God's going to surround his people and give them one more shot. Say, listen, here I am. I'm your Messiah. I'm here to protect you. I'm here, to, and we're gonna, and we're gonna take over the place. It's just in my my kind of generic, real easy, simple. Uh, he's saying to his people, "I'm here. This is gonna come. Are you gonna come to me and repent?" Remember, if you have any questions, you can always send them in. Ask, call, but also study the word for yourself. Take each of the scriptures I mentioned. Go back and study the whole. Whole section in the context it was meant. Context is important. You know, don't take scriptures out of context. Chapter 14. Zechariah um, finishes up with the coming of the day of the Lord. And it says in chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the coming of the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations. And remember, all nations against Israel to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall be cut off, shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go and fight against the nations as he fights on the day of battle. Pretty cool to hear that God's fighting for you, amen? Now we see that Jesus himself will step down. We know this. It says, on this day shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Where? On the Mount of Olives. That lies before Jerusalem. On the east and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from the east to west by the very wide valley. And on that one half, the Mount shall move northward and the other half southward. Now, prophetically, we know exactly where Jesus is coming back. And we know that the church will meet Jesus in the air. Here, God is stepping back down on the earth where the church is going to meet Jesus in the air. The church will be caught up with him, and then when Jesus comes back, now we will come back with him. Now, 1 Thessalonians says, 1 Thessalonians 4 says this, then those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we all will be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one, encourage one another with these words. Now, when Jesus, when Jesus comes for Israel after the tribulation, he goes after them. When was the last time you see Jesus appear to the disciples? Now follow me. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 12. And when he had said these things, remember now he just got resurrected, and he was about to be taken up. And it says, when he said these things, they looked around him, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them with white robes. He said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Because they're thinking he's coming back real quick. This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of what? Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. We know that, listen, the angels are telling them how he left, that Jesus left, will come back the same way 
it'll be right there. What's amazing that we can see threads throughout the whole Word of God, the whole Bible, how things are going to be played out for the nation of Israel and for the church and how different we really are. You know, verse 5 says, And you shall flee from the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach as I, and as you, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Holy ones can be seen now here as saints. Some think angels. As we will be in heaven, so we will come back with him. So we're looking at as saints. And on that day there will be no, no, no light, cold, or frost. And it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night. But evening time shall be, or evening time, there shall be light. Kind of like Alaska experiences all the time. Almost sometimes it, it's all, it seems like it's always light up there. And on that day, living waters shall flow from Jerusalem. Again, living waters. Having of them to eastern sea, half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in the summer as in the winter. And the Lord will be king over the earth. On that day, the Lord will one, and his name, one. The whole land shall be turned into the plain of Gibeah to Ramon south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate, to the corner gate, and from the Tower of Hanel to the king's wine press. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a de decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. Interesting that Jerusalem will be the center of attention once again, even politically militarily, religiously, now and later, will continue eternity. And, th and this shall be the plague of which the Lord will strike the peoples away towards again Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they standing still on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. To me, when I, when I kind of read that scripture, it's almost like a, a, a bomb goes off, like, a, like a, maybe a nuke, I don't know, just guessing at that one. Because it says their their flesh will rot while they stand there, and their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets. Remember, if you ever watched the uh, Indiana Jones series with uh, Harrison Ford, if you watched the first one, remember they, they were, the Germans captured the Ark of the Covenant, and they were opening it, and they were testing it out, and then all of a sudden the, the guy's face starts like blowing away into dust. If you've seen the movie, you understand what I'm saying? Kind of like that. that. That would be pretty, I don't know, I guess frightful for some people to see, but I don't know. Cinematics. But uh, it says on the verse 13, it says, On that day a great panic from the Lord shall fall on them, so each of them sees their hand of another, and the hand of one will be raised against the other, hand of the other. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, and garments of great abundance. And the plague, like this plague, shall fall on the horses, and the mules, and camels, and donkeys, and whatever beasts may be in those camps. And then everyone who survives the nation shall come against the Jerusalem, shall go up year after year and worship the king and the Lord of hosts and to keep the feast of Booth. Now this feast was when God cared for his people out of the wanderings. Um, it may be feast of Booth, in yours, or depending on your translation, maybe they say tabernacle. Uh, the Jews would go outside the city and set up tents or tabernacles to stay and to commemorate what God had done. In, in their past, it will continue in eternity. At some one, I'm assuming from the scriptures, also from uh, you know, we will all celebrate, you know, uh, that time. And verse 17 says, "And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of Hosts, there will be no rain on them. If you don't go, the rain will be withheld." Verse 18. And if the family of Egypt does not go up to present themselves, then on them no rain. There, there shall be a plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. On this day, on this shall be punishment in Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. Meaning, commemorate the Lord's provision. Do we kind of commemorate anything in our lives? Do we, you know, do we celebrate what the Lord has done? Remember an old song, Look What the Lord Has Done. It was a heal of my body, touch my mind. He saved me just in time. Oh, I'm going to praise his name. That's supposed to be a Pentecostal song. You know, we should start singing that again in a Pentecostal church, right? <laughs> but, you know, 
you, you think when he talks about the feast, you know, kind of commemorating the feast, will there be sacrifices made? Uh, we know that Jesus took every, care of everything on the cross. With, uh, we know the sin, but will there be something done for commemorating what God has done in these celebrations? It, it's hard to say. We just don't know. Uh, we commemorate the communion every right. We we take communion once a month, and or you may take it every week depending on your church. If you're not if you don't go to first assembly, but um, we don't take communion for forgiveness of sins because we know that Jesus. We we're just remembering Jesus' sacrifice, what Jesus had did. Uh, communion does not take away your sin. Uh, Jesus did his sacrifice, his blood, his resurrection, his. God's plan, His God's redemptive plan. So the act of taking communion does not take away your sin. It's just us commemorating what Jesus did for us. We're partaking in that. We're we're celebrating in that. I hope you understand that. You know, Jesus takes away the sins, not something that we do. We can't do anything that would be religion if we felt that way. Uh, Jesus takes away the sins through His blood, His sacrifice, His resurrection. We. we that's the only way you can be saved is through Christ. But we will be commemorating what God has done, right? See, these are the thoughts that may, these are some thoughts that may come across your path as you study. Well, what do we take? Why are we celebrating a feast? It's a commemoration. It's just a remembrance of what God has done. So we'll have a party. Maybe there'll be parties and, I don't know, eating, dancing. I don't know. I don't know what they're, what we're going to be doing. But God has invited everyone or everyone or, it's going to happen. All right, let's finish up. Verse 20 to 21 says this. And the Lord, and on that day, another one, and on that day, there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bulls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take to of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And they shall no longer be traitor of the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Wherever God goes, He makes things holy. Things given over to Him. To, what does holy What does holy mean? Holiness means means set apart for God. That means you are. We think of holy in a different in a different kind of different way. Like you're perfect, pure. Your holiness is set apart for God. Service for God. Whatever is surrendered to God or to the Lord is holy. We we give it. The, you know what I mean? Holiness just means to be set apart for God. And we see that even as, as we wrap up the book of Zechari Zechariah, in these last three chapters, we know that God reigns. God is who he said he is, and he's going to take care of his people. You know what? And if we go, if as, as a church, when we go up with him, when he calls us home, we'll come back with him as we, and we'll celebrate with the, with the nation of Israel as one big family. And that's a time I, I, I wait for. And there's a time I can't wait to see how everything just plays out because no one has all the answers to, to, to how this is all. We have an idea through the prophetic, prophetic words in the scriptures. So I encourage you, you know, go back and look at Daniel if you look worry about end times. Go back and look at Daniel. Go back and look at Ezekiel. Go back and look at some of the other prophetic books. Go through Zechariah again. See how God's going to do some things. And, and then, you know, Jump into the book Revelation, see what John was told, shown by Christ himself, and just put it all together and say, okay, and, and we're going to see what happens. Don't fight and argue with people who are maybe uh, post-trib or um, mid-trib. or it, it Don't cause a division. It's not meant to. Um, but share with them with Scripture um, and, and love on them. And it's, it, it, some subjects are, are good to... It's okay to, 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 to talk about. But salvation, we know, is only through Christ, Christ's sacrifice, His blood, um, and living a life with Him and serving Him. So I hope you enjoyed the book of Zechariah. Um, please read the book of Malachi. Um, if you're Italian, maybe the book of Malachi. No, that's a joke. Okay. Um, but re start reading the book of Malachi as we will finish up. Uh, the Minor Prophets, probably next week or maybe the week after. But get excited. Get excited what God's doing. But just don't get caught up in what you see on social media and what you hear in the news. It's, it's, get into your word. Trust in Christ and believe in Him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. And I thank you for what you gave the, the prophet Zechariah to say. 
I thank you, Father, we can glean on off of this, Father, wisdom and, and, and guidance, Father. We know that the Holy Spirit really guides us, Father. But I, I, I thank you for the wisdom that we gain from this and th what they went through in their lives, Lord, that we can come sometimes compared to what we go through in our lives, Father. So continue to allow your Spirit to breathe over us, Father, and give us a freshness, and Lord. But let there be an excitement, Father. Let there be an excitement to know that every day as we read your Word, we, you reveal more and more of who you are. And I thank you for all that you do and who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. And Lord willing, we'll see you on our Sunday morning on YouTube or Facebook. Or not, we'll see you next Wednesday. Be blessed.